Hopefully a few more folks will be joining us. I've opened the chat window here, and I've pasted in something that Herbert sent today. Can you see the, the uh, chat window? There's an icon on the upper left-hand corner of your Google chat screen. Uh, with, it looks like a comment box. Uh, mine's blue with white lines on it. So if you can see that, then uh, you can see the link for PyRx. And yep. so I think maybe the first thing to do uh, would be uh, to give Herbert a couple minutes to explain to us what PyRx is. And, and then I'm thinking we should just go ahead and try to follow it. Good idea. Okay. All right. To understand what PyRx is, you have to understand what Autodoc is. Autodoc is this wonderful tool that does a nice computer simulation of the docking of a ligand in a macromolecule and does it as a, a, a fairly accurate calculation. It has become sort of the routine screener for drug design. The original version of it is called Autodoc. That has been around for a while. It does very, very well. But it's a little difficult to use and is a bit slow. The latest, fastest version is called Autodoc Vina, the INA. That is easier to use and is considerably faster. In some cases, about 20 times faster. There are several different packages that will hand you Autodoc or Autodoc Vina or both. The students at, at, at RIT experimented for a while, and the package they found that gives the, the, the easiest to use interface for large-scale screening is PYRX. For strange licensing reasons, it comes only with Autodoc Vina. It is capable of also using Autodoc, but you have to install Autodoc separately. Okay? All that I'm asking you to do with the files that are at this website on SourceForge is to install PYRX with the Vena that's in it. That is enough to do good Autodoc runs on most normal cases. Certainly the things like the hydrolases should work fine. There are some subtle cases where you want to go back to basically using Autodoc or Autodoc Vena by hand. And that's not quite as easy to do with PYRX. For example, a, 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 a technique called marching windows is, is not that easy to do with PYRX. But I don't think we need that for the next year. So to simplify life, since we're clearly having trouble with software installs in a heterogeneous set of environments, what we'd like you to do is just start with PYRX. Okay? It will provide a tool to use to verify whether something which is supposedly able to bind a particular ligand has a very good chance of binding that ligand. It doesn't guarantee it. You can still get fooled by any computer calculation, and it may turn out that what happens in vitro, or even worse, in vivo, is different. But it's a pretty good indicator. So it would be a good idea to install it. Okay? Any questions on what I've said so far? Is anybody there? Paul, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, good. All right. Now, I am going to try... <laughs> Uh, let's hope this works. I'm going to try sharing my screen. Okay. We're going to see whether this works. Boy, am I afraid. All right. Do my desktop. Okay, so I'm going to do a desktop. Start screen share. Okay, so now I am hopefully screen sharing. Okay. I'm going to open a browser window. I'm using Firefox. I don't know what other people are using. Okay. And then I am going to attempt to simply do what you should be doing, which is to copy and paste 
the URL that I, I gave you, which unfortunately I am not seeing in the chat right now. So I'm going to go back to my sent message. Hopefully you have all got the same thing. If not, I will give it to you again. Okay. All right, so let me get the right one. All right, we are now scrolling through the email messages, just looking for the place where I sent you the URL. Okay, so here, here is the URL, which I am highlighting right now. Okay, and now I am simply going to open another browser window and use that as a URL to go to. So this is the site I'm asking you to go to. If any of you have been browsing around and looking, you'll know that the current version of PYRX is 0 0.9, not 0 0.8. The reason I'm pointing you at 0 0.8 is that's the free version. It'll cost you something like $140 for the 0 0.9. It's heavily used, and for the purposes we have, it works quite well. Okay. You will find in this directory two versions, a PYRX 0.8 setup.exe and a PYRX 0.8.dmg. The .exe is for you Windows users. The .dmg is for the Mac users. I happen to be on a Mac, so I would go, I would go to the DMG. Whichever one it is, you want to download you know, the one that's appropriate for your machine, and then you want to double-click it. Okay, how many people do we have who are Mac and how many who are Windows? Uh. We have one Psy. I don't think that's machine time. Well, I couldn't tell if my microphone was on or not. I'm on a Mac. I'm always on a Mac. Okay. So it looks like we've got two Windows and three Mac here today. All right. Since the, since the Macs are in a majority, we will do a Mac demonstration. I can't get the download to start. It's still only right. partial. So I'm going to start a download on my screen, and let's see what happens if I try it on mine. So I'm going to click on this and you should go to a screen which looks like this. Pi RX virtual screening tool, your download will start in two seconds, one second, zero seconds. Okay. Now it offers me two choices. One is to save the file or the other is to open it with disk image mounter. Okay. My advice, especially since you may want to simply distribute this to students, etc., you know, on, on your own, would be to actually save the file. Okay. And then you click OK. And in Firefox, up here is something which is normally an arrow, and then it changes to a very tiny little you know, time going by time bar. Uh, and when it comes back to being an arrow, it's downloaded. Mm. Is it not downloading? <laughs> Tell me your problems. See, and so on, on, on Firefox, I got the arrow went big for a while and then turned little. And then if I if I click on the download, I see it as a download. And it happens I've done it before. That's why I have a paren one on it. You you probably won't have a paren one. Are are are. You have to talk to me because I can't see anything other than my screen at the moment. So oh, my, my Firefox says my download download will start in zero seconds, but it's been saying that for seven or eight or nine or ten seconds. Hmm. Okay, fine. There's a backup procedure for that. Okay. All right. So let us go back. I'm I'm going to ignore what I have successfully downloaded here. Okay. I'm going to go back to where we started from. Okay. All right. So let me, let me, yeah, the, the process, okay? Here's PyRx 0.8.dmg. I'm going to click on it again, okay? You then come to the second window. Look where I am circling. See this thing that says direct link? Yeah. 
you can try that. Yeah. If that doesn't work, you can also try another mirror. Yeah. If that doesn't work, then it sounds like you are having SourceForge locked by your proxy or firewall in your, your institution. That will be a major problem because a lot of stuff that we need for this project comes from SourceForge. I just attempted to email you that file. You know, it works for me sometimes and doesn't work for me other times. Every time I've gone for promo, I would say 50% of the time this happens, 50% of the time it works. So it's not a firewall. I'll just start over. Well, the, the direct, direct link and another mirror very often help. But you want you you want a copy of that file, and I think Paula sent you one. I can I can post a copy uh, somewhere else if you like. Let me try one more time. Okay, those of you who are on Windows, the process is pretty much the same up to this point, except you're downloading the EXE and not the DMG. going in the Windows world. I, Mike, I, I don't think it needs to go in the PyMall folder. No, 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 no. This is, this is separate from PyMall. This is a completely separate package. The hook between Autodoc and PyMall is a plugin that you will have gotten in already. It's just the pieces it needs to point to aren't there yet. Okay, but this is sort of a simpler alternative than using PyMall. The pictures will not be as pretty as with PyMall with this. It won't allow you to do as many things, but it will allow you to do some things which are actually very interesting. And as a matter of fact, you should have all gotten an email I sent a little later, which points to a folder that has two test files. But first, we need to have the program in. So the idea was to install the program, okay? and then I would have you download the test files. But first, we need the program. So who's stuck on install on you know downloading the program? Mine is downloading now. It says one okay. more minute. Very good. Okay, that's something. That's hopeful. Okay, Julia said she already installed it. Michael is installing. Or Mike Picard is installing now. Okay. Well, every, everyone who is installing it, when you when it says it's completed, it's installed, it offers you the option of starting it. Okay, I will want you to start it, but I need to download the the, 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 the test files also for you to have something to start it with. Okay, so for those of you who have already downloaded and installed it, I sent you another email, which points to a directory which contains two files. One of those files is a macromolecule for GHB. It's 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 a, it's a hypothetical porin, okay? okay? And the other is NAP. That's the ligand. We need a macromolecule. We need a ligand. Pardon me. My phone is ringing. I'm just going to answer it. Hello. Shoot. Good. Well, I'm I'm I'm, I'm on the line. I'm on, on a meeting. Okay? No, I'm fine. Thank you. Bye-bye. Just my wife checking if I can see after the eye doctor and drive myself or she needs to drive me. Okay. All right. So. <laughs> uh, crashing SourceForge. I believe it. We're crashing SourceForge? Well, Mike's comment in the chat window. Yeah, it's a slow download. We're crashing SourceForge. 
So, well, all right. So the other two files don't come from don't come from SourceForge. So you basically, those of you who are having trouble with SourceForge, a good thing to do would be to lo download the other two files. Tell, can you guys tell me? This is telling me that I can't open this package because somewhere I have security preferences that say that I can't. I will show you how to solve that. Okay. That's not that that that's not terribly difficult. You're on a Mac, I take it. Yes. Okay, fine. So, just leave that in its current state. Okay. Mm -hmm. Go to System Preferences. Yep. Okay. Which you will see on my screen shortly. Okay, let me center that on my screen. Okay. And under System Preferences. You find you know, lots and lots of things you can do, but one of them on the top row should be yeah. security and privacy. Yeah. Double click that. Yeah. Okay. And you should find, yeah, you know, at the bottom, if it is blocked a download, there should be somewhere about here where I'm I'm, I'm circling, an offer to accept it anyway. But it needs to be in okay. the state of having blocked the download. You can accept it right there. Okay. Okay, and accept yeah. it. Okay. Once you have it successfully downloaded, you want to double click it and do what it says to install it. I will show you. Uh, okay, you, you you got past your security and privacy hang up. Did, I did indeed. Good. So what you what, what you're trying to get to is something which <coughs> it opens pyrx.dmg. Py yes. Okay. It gives you this thing that looks like a cardboard box. Yes. You double click that. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it claims that it's from an unidentified Developer, okay, and then you do your security preferences, and it you know, allows you to you know get into it. So yep. I will go, okay. I will go to my system preferences, okay, and where's my security? Open anyway, okay, and now, okay. The package will run a program to determine the software can be installed. Okay, you want to continue on that. Okay, mm -hmm. you are now in the installer. The Windows install looks very similar. Okay, so you know, in Windows you should be you know, seeing something similar, mm -hmm. and then you install it under Applications. Okay, and you go, yeah, you let it run through and let it go to a finish, like any other you know Mac package. I'm not going to advance mine because, quite frankly, I'd like to keep the installation I already did. But if I have, to, if some of you is really stuck and I need to do it, I'll do it. Just let me see if you can get through without my doing that. No, mine's happy. It's successful. Excellent. All right. Okay, so everyone should be in PyRx. All right, so I'm, I'm going to go get in PyRx as well. Close a lot of the extra stuff I've got open at the moment just so I don't crash my machine on running out of memory which is a problem we've been having okay so let me close a little more okay we'll leave that open because I don't want to close this conversation okay so for those of you who are on a Mac if you need to start some future time under applications mm -hmm. uh, you will have uh, somewhere down here in this infinite list of applications an icon for PyRx. Mm -hmm. So you double click PyRx and or you know you let it start itself when you, you you did the install. In any case, eventually in the fullness of time, okay, it will actually start Python, because it's a Python application. And it will load and it will load and it will load and it will load and it will load. Okay? Mm -hmm. And you eventually get a screen that looks like this. Okay, is everybody at that point? Yep. Julia, Mike, Stefan? Mine's still downloading, but I'll just watch and take it. No, 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 no. Let's get everyone on this. Because the next part's.
the, the place where people can really get tripped up, so I want to make sure everyone's doing it. Uh, well, mine says it's got 22 minutes left. 22 20. minutes? <laughs> yeah. I think my internet's not going so great. Are you on a dial-up modem? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> All right. Could you try and download the sample files? In yeah, I, I, I got those down. You got those but, down? Okay. All right. So what I'm going... Are you on a Mac or a PC? I'm on a Mac. Fine. I am going to plant in the same folder a copy of this, you know, installation kit. Okay. Right. So just you, 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 you can actually watch me do it as I do it. Okay. So we'll go here and Firefox. Okay. The window. Okay. And now I'm going to go to drive. Dot google.com and that's BBSL and PyRx test data and I am simply going to do something naughty I'm going to mix a thing that says test data with a program so I'm gonna I'm, I'm, mess, I'm messing up the self documentation of this thing I'm going to do a file upload okay and I'm going to go to my downloads As you can tell, my machine is in need of some cleaning up. I'm going to pick up the one I just downloaded, you know, a few minutes ago. Okay, it's uploading one item. And since you were able to download the test files, you should be able to download this a little more efficiently than from SourceForge. Cool. Okay. There's more than one way to skin a program. <laughs> okay. It should be there now. I see it. See if you can download a little better than 22 minutes. How did you do all of that? How did I do all of what? I'll be glad to explain. You know, whatever. Documents from the email into into Pyre X. He he took it from his download folder. I had downloaded it before. I, this is what I showed you before. My 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 Firefox downloads into a folder called Downloads. So I took the download I did before. And I did something naughty. I put it on Google Drive. Um, I'm actually not violating any licenses. I'm simply making a mess in terms of documentation. Because the folder I put it in says PyRx test data. Now how do I get those? Never mind. I'll find it. Load molecule? Well, what I would like you to do at the moment mm -hmm. is simply make sure you've got a running PyRx and a copy of 4GHB... ACA, okay? I'll tell you what this stands for, okay? 4GHB is the molecule from, from the PDB that we're going to work with. Yeah. I it happens you. that for some versions of Autodoc, they don't handle alternate confirmations well. So I hand edited the 4GHB from the PDB to just make it alternate confirmation A. Then I al there's also a problem with some versions of Autodoc with selenium. I substituted sulfur for selenium. So mm -hmm. this is a modified version of a PDB entry, which I made. Okay? And, and so this, yeah, the, 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 this is all the confirmer A, uh, sulfur for selenium. No, you do not have to do most of this when you're working with, with, with PyRx. It's, it's pretty good in terms of dealing with this. For example, it will ask you about all the confirmers right there. NAP is the ligand that we're going to use in PDB format. You can use other formats for some of these, but I personally think it's less confusing for students and such to stick to the PDB format. It's a pretty clear self-documenting form. And, and NAP is actually NADP, that cofactor for uh, you yeah. know oxidation reduction reactions. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, the PDB uses three-letter codes. So they, they, they actually have an NAD and an NAP for the two states. Okay. Both of which are actually NADP. The one I'm taking is the NAP. Okay. All right, so who's still stuck? How, how is the 22-minute download doing? Uh, it's about halfway done now. That's the 22-minute or, or the one from, from the... Uh, the, the one you just gave me. 
It's about halfway done. That sounds much more encouraging. Well, while, while, while we're waiting for Mike, I wanted to mention that I, I, visited, I visited NSF Fastlane today, and we're still not funded, but it says that the actual wording is a program recommendation for award was, was concurred by the Cognizant Division Directorate on, on May 29, 2015. However, no, no award is ensured, and the recommendation duration is 24 months with an effective date of, of June 15, 2015, are subject to change. The grantee institution assumes any pre-award costs at its own risk. NSF may request additional information. So, so uh, what they're saying is hopefully we'll see a notice of award by June 15th, uh, and, but if we spend any money before then, we're doing it at our own risk. Yeah. Uh, it, my, my experience with the NSF is that unless Congress intervenes and does something which really shakes up their budget, they tend to you know, execute successfully on almost all of those notices. There are, there are occasional exceptions, but most of the time when they tell you that they're trying to get it out by June 15th, they get it out by June 15th. Sometimes what they will do is get it out by you know, the 1st of July and do it retroactive to the 15th. Now, but they, you should pay attention to the notice. You don't get in trouble with any of your grants. You don't spend any of the money until your grants people say, it's an award that you've got and you can spend. Right. That's, that's my advice. Okay? But in terms of emotions, you can feel pretty good. You can feel good as long as it's not expensive. <laughs> <laughs> right. You have to keep a sense of humor in this business. Well, you do. Yeah. Okay? All right. So how far along are people now? Does everyone have the data files downloaded? I do. <clears throat> Anyone who doesn't. Okay, Mike's got the data files. Mike, do you have the application downloaded yet? Uh, it's, it's Steph and Paul that it's downloading still. I'm at about 90 megabytes downloaded so far. Okay. So you're, 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 you're well past the three quarters point. Good. Yeah. All right. I'm very glad I put that thing up on, on, on Google Drive. We now know for the future. We need to plant more stuff on Google Drive and less on SourceForge. Yeah. All right. We're learning things. This is very educational. All right. While we are waiting, I'm going to go back in and start explaining some of what we're going to be doing. Well, I would if I could get this thing to open successfully. I'm going to minimize this. Uh, let me go here. Okay. Now. All right. So what you will see here when all you have it running is a bunch of tabs on this top left window. Okay. And in the first one, you're going to have a thing called molecules. In the second one, you have Autodoc. Autodoc also ends up with a list of molecules with segregated into two lists, ligands and macromolecules. Right now, when you go in, you'll have nothing in, in, you know, in them. What our objective is going to be is going to be to get the ligand under the ligand list and the macromolecule under the macromolecule list. In my case, it's already there. Okay? Now, notice that this is a PDBQT file. That's the favorite internal format used by Autodoc. It's not quite the same thing as a PDB file. A lot of similarities, but not quite the same. Some graphics programs are willing to display PDB QT files. Others are not. Fortunately, there's a tab down here for a thing called OpenBabel. OpenBabel will translate almost anything used in terms of, of, of macromolecular crystallography to almost anything else used in macromolecular crystallography. Okay? But you don't have to because what I'm going to show you is that when you download the molecules as PDB, they're going to automatically get converted to PDBQT by this package. It will take care of it. So you don't have to do that manual conversion that you do have to do when you work with most of the other versions of Autodoc. Okay? That's a very convenient feature. The other nice feature about this is that it runs with 
two wizards. One is Vina Wizard, the other is called Autodoc Wizard. Because we have not done the old Autodoc install, we're just going to use the Vina Wizard. So if you accidentally cl click on the Autodoc Wizard, because I keep saying Autodoc, things like that, okay? Go back, yeah, you, you, the one you're going to want is the Vina Wizard. Vina is a later version, as I said, it's got this, it, an easier to deal with license than Autodoc does. For reasons I do not understand. Uh, this comes from scripts. They're a great institution, but they keep changing their mind as to how you do things. Right? And they, if for, v, if for Vina, they have gotten you know, very, very flexible about allowing you to download and share stuff. And so l less fuss. Okay? Where are things at, uh, Stefan? Uh, it all just got downloaded, so I'm almost done installing. Right. Lovely. Thank you. All right. So soon we're going to have everyone on the same screen. Get some load off this machine. machine will be quieter. Oh yes, yeah, so you get this off the machine too. Get the out of here. Fine. All right, I'm good to go now. All right, so everyone should now be looking at this screen. Okay? You're in this wizard, the Vina wizard. If you accidentally clicked on one of the others, just click on the Vina wizard again. Okay? At the bottom, there, there are choices on how to execute Vina. You all should be able to execute it locally, so the local check button should be clicked. Okay. Unless you have an unusual machine, the, the, you know, the, the local version is the one to run. Okay. And then you click on Start. Yep. When you click on Start, notice what has happened. I've now gone to that second list of the things that it thinks it's got in. Okay. And I have different options under here because we're now under Select Molecules. What I would like you to do is I would like you to click on Add Ligand. Okay. When you click on Add Ligand, you now should be able to navigate to wherever it is you downloaded your particular you know, copy of NAP.PDB to. In my case, it happens to be sitting here in this folder. Okay. And I didn't alphabetize this list. You can alphabetize your list, whatever. But notice there's a file called nap.pdb. If you click on that, okay, and you click on open, okay, notice I, I've been doing this several times. I've been practicing for this event. Okay. You get in, in, in the window on the left an nap.pdbqt. That's the converted copy. And in the graphics window on the right, you have a very nice copy of the molecule. That is NADP. Okay. All right. It's, it's there. It's not as good as PyMol. I mean, I will not for a moment claim, but it's good enough. And it's worth it for the packaging that you know, everything gives. I would like you also to do an add of a macromolecule. Okay. And my macromolecule happens to be sitting up here. And the way you would do is you click on that and you open it. Okay. And now comes the business of alternate confirmations. It is fine to take chain A. Okay. Just click OK. Now it's making the Autodoc macromolecule, and notice I now gained another one here. Because this is a mass screening program, you can put in as many ligands as you want, you can put in as many macromolecules as you want, but, as you notice, we've been having stability problems with a lot of machines. So my advice is limit yourself to one macromolecule 
and a modest number of ligands. 10, 15, something like that at worst. Okay. For two reasons. One is keeping your machine up, and the other is it can take a long time. Once you have successfully selected one ligand, okay, and one macromolecule, okay, it says one ligand selected, and it says, you know, which macromolecule was selected, you will then be able to click on forward. Is everyone to this stage? Is there anyone who's not? No one there. Everyone's there? Good. Then my advice would be click on forward. Okay. All right. Uh, hang on a second. My forward button is grayed out here. Then you haven't completed selecting one ligand and one macromolecule. Select. Oh, select both of them. You 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 need you need you, you. Let me go back. Okay. Okay, I got you. Okay. You need to have one ligand selected, and you need to have a macromolecule selected. You can have more than one ligand selected. Just I would like to sort of finish this session in finite time, and this is going to be a substantial run all by itself. So it's going to show you interesting things. Okay. Okay. All right. So has everyone made it to forward? Yes. So we're now here. Yes. Okay. So now. It's telling you what it is going to be you know, working on. Okay. It has, if you notice, the picture has gained a box. See this box up here? Okay. There's a box. This is the search box. Autodog Vina is very, very flexible on what you can do with the search box. You can break a lot of Autodoc rules, if any of you are familiar with Autodoc, in terms of the size of the search box, and you'll live. Okay. I'm just going to use the one that it gave me by default. Okay. So I've got this search box. It's sort of right in the middle of the molecule. I'm going to click forward. Okay. Notice that we now have some text where the picture used to be. This is the log file of the run. At the bottom of that text is a progress bar. If you are a very patient soul, you will notice that every once in a while another asterisk will appear. Okay? Your objective is to make it to 100%. While it's doing that, I would suggest you ask questions. Okay? especially any of you who haven't gotten this far. I have a question about the size of the box, Herbert. Yes. Is there an advantage to having a bigger versus a smaller box? Okay. The old Autodoc doesn't do well with boxes much bigger than about 35 by 35 by 35. Mm -hmm. You'll notice the one we had here was about 25 by 25 by 25. Right. All versions will work well with that. Autodoc itself, you go over 35 by 35 by 35 or, or you know, 20 by 30 by 40, things in those range, that range, it doesn't get very accurate answers. Vina, I found, I've been able to do a box three, four times as big. And it has done an excellent job of homing in on the best site in that huge box. Mm -hmm. Much better than I expected. But in general, you're better off doing several runs with shifted boxes if you're not sure where to look. You know, where, where the active site is. The other trick to be careful of is that if you center the box entirely on an active site and make it very, very small, you may need leave no room for the ligand to move in in solvent. So you want to make the box you know, extend reasonably into solvent to leave room for the ligand to come in. Because the box is actually the box for the ligand, not the box for the macromolecule. All right. So what this is doing is it happens to be trying eight times 
to dock the molecule. It's trying, you know, it's trying a conformers. You can do more. I, however, have not had great success with trying to do more than twenty. So, so we okay. conformers. It actually bends, basically twists the shape of the molecule and tries different shapes. Yes, and it will tell you the RMSD of the change it made. Okay. We'll see that we we will see that shortly. Well, not so shortly, depending upon the speed of your computer. Okay, but when it makes it to one hundred percent, we will be able to look graphically at the different conformers this picked. Now, I did a bit of a cheat here. The molecule I gave you is an unusual one, this porin. It does a significant amount of promiscuous binding and puts molecules in multiple orientations. Most of the time when you have something that's a really you know, strong ligand, it's just going to slam in in a small number of orientations. But this is more fun. Yeah, I kind of like this molecule. So mine just, he, yours what? Mine just finished, Herbert. Um, but I had a question for you about. Um, so you downloaded the asymmetric unit from the PDB, for, uh, but I wonder, does it make a difference if you have the the functional structure or? It depends. It depends on the molecule. For this particular molecule and the places that it happens to bind. The only impact of, of going with the larger molecule versus yeah the the, the full uh, biological unit yeah would so be it's like that's, that it's going to get a lot slower right. if you try and put a box to span a lot of it okay it's, yeah it'd be good, yeah but if you stick to boxes of reasonable size it doesn't make much difference okay because yeah basically it's working within the box. Um. So there's a question for you, and maybe this is what you meant when you're talking about the exhaustiveness. Yeah. Does it have a way to take the ligand and change its conformation? It does change its conformation. It treats it treats the ligand as flexible. When okay. we get to the result list, you'll you yeah. If you look at the analyzed results, is it is it smart is it smart about what bonds it can rotate and what bonds it can't? It's pretty smart. This is the this is a pretty intelligent program. Okay. That's not perfect. As I said, surprises happen, different things happen in vitro and in vivo than happen in the computer. But it's certainly doing a much better job in terms of trying to fit things than, you know, for example, you know, Promol, which is doing a rigid fit. Right. Promol is doing a rigid fit. This is doing a flexible fit. This, so it's, uh, thinking, uh, yeah. it's rotating around the phosphates in our NADP, for example. It's trying to. It's probably not doing a whole lot with the flat nicotinamide ring. I hope not. Yeah. Take a look at the eight results you got. They, 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 you can click on each one, and it'll show you in the little graphics box what each one looks like, and you can zoom it. Is it doing anything with the macromolecule, or does it just treat that as static? Uh, I th I, lo looking at this particular run, I do not believe it changed anything in the macromolecule. I believe it is, in fact, capable of treating residues in the macromolecule as flexible, but to use that feature, I think we need to get you into the full auto, Autodoc Vina, Autodoc installation, and use the Autodoc Vina plugin for, for Pymol. Then I know you have control over the flexibility of the macromolecule. Okay, so... I haven't seen it here. Okay, so if my macromolecule happens to be one that has water molecules identified to it, will it move those out of the way? It seems to it seems to move most of the things you don't want out of the way. For example, it it, 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 it prunes hydrogens and puts them back in. Okay. All right. So yeah, it, it, is it perfect? No. Does it, it 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 does a good enough job that if it is saying that you, for example, get a, a binding energy of minus twelve, that's certainly worth looking at in in, in some glass or and see if it really does do something like that. When 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 you start seeing Binding energies. Okay. When, when, when you start seeing things which are, are you know, where's my zoom? I lost my this my no, that's my full screen. Okay, where's my zoom? I forgot where my zoom is on this. Some of these magic mites, I just drag the uh, drag two fingers across the top of it. You can probably just drag drag two fingers on your keypad. Oh yeah, you're right. 
two fingers work on mine. I was, I was trying to do with the mouse. That was stupid of me. Anyway, so here here okay. is the first yes. conformer. It's called mode zero. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm now going to click on mode one. Notice that molecule just you know it didn't just move; it changed shape, which is not surprising because it's got an RMSD of 3.353, and I've gone from you know minus nine kilocalories per mole to minus 8.9. So these are actually close in terms of, of you know how well they're bound. But they're certainly not bound to the same. Okay? If I scroll down to the one that is at the bottom of the list, okay, at 8.3. Mm. Notice it's really quite dramatically different. Okay, I mean, so it's, it's, really, it's really trying stuff. It's picked the lo the most stable one as the first one, and it's comparing everything else back to that. Uh, I believe it's comparing it to to, to its original confirmation. Yeah, yeah. You know, how much it had to distort it from what we, what we had to do. Okay. But the 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 one at the top there, your your mode zero, yeah, has the best binding affinity, right? Yes. So that just happened that it was in the optimal confirmation? I don't think that's terribly surprising because I think that was the one from Ligandex with the PDB. That's the one that you took out of there. Uh, that's okay. one I took out of there. That's not normally going to happen then. I don't know. We, we, I've, been, I've been mainly using ones from Ligandex, So they basically, you know, that, 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 that tends to be a pretty good confirmation to start with. We'll have to try ones that are, yep. are, are particularly bad to begin with and see how they come out. All right. Uh, the, this really does, you know, suggest a, a, a you know a, a feasible binding. Okay, let, let's uh, check in with everybody. Um, how are things going, uh, Julia, Colette, Stefan? Mine's at about ninety-five percent. Okay, when you when you get to your ninety-five percent. You should end up with this list under analyze results. And as Paul, I don't know who's got two finger mice and whatever, but if you can, you want to zoom it. I thought there was another way to zoom it. If you, oh, you, can if you have a center wheel, wheel, you can scroll your center wheel. Oh, okay, thank you. Julia, how about you? Julia says it's close. He's almost done. Mike, has, has yours, has yours uh, finished this analysis yet? I'm at about 88% uh, maybe. Oh, that's not bad. This is about the typical speed of order doc runs. So it's basically something to do. See, if this were a lot faster, you could basically use this as the first thing you did. But in terms of the timing, you can do a lot of promol screenings, narrow things down, right. and then use this, where it's more of a time investment, on the ones that are more likely to be productive. And the ones that, you know, promol has said, this is probably, you know, going to bind to some ligand in, you know, in, in this class, are worth feeding into Autodoc and see what they do. And this is this is you know this was recommended by Ketty Barty and her sister, Constantina Barty, as the best way to do it, and I think they're right. And Ketty, certainly, I should say Ketty and Constantina were two students at Dowling College where Herbert used to be. And they transferred to RIT last year so they could get some of the upper division classes they needed to go because they want to go to medical school. But it turns out that they're both really dynamite research students. Yeah. <clears throat> they, they they have been working with Autodoc for years now, and I kind of trust what they say. They seem to know what they're doing. Got mine. Okay. You can make prettier pictures in Pymol, but I think these are are you know quite informative. They need to tend to some administrivia here, so I'm going to mute my microphone. I'm not going to shut things off so that I'll be able to save the broadcast, and once I save it, I'll do my best to get this stuff posted to our, our uh, Google uh, Google site uh, and so people can look at it. Okay. I mean, it really can distort the molecule by a lot. Here's one RMSD of, of 8.9. Yeah. 
8.592. Okay. And they're all over the place. But as I said, I cheated a bit because this particular molecule is willing to bind NAP all over the place in all kinds of conformations. Is it possible that it may be bound two of them to mine? To NAPs? Yeah. Sure. Okay. I think that's what I decided to do. Yeah. You, 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 you. Okay. The, 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 my guess is what you did was you selected two. Uh, uh, under the Autodoc menu, okay, that you did instead of having one ligand, you had two. Um, okay. Well, maybe. Yeah. The, the, this is this is a screening program. It's used for drug design. Okay. So it's very very happy doing lots of things with lots of ligands. It's a, it's a Python. It is a Python access to Autodoc, and in this particular case, the Autodoc Viner version of it. But it's also capable of, of accessing the older Autodoc as well. Well, mine is done, and I can see a bunch of different confirmations. But because I can't zoom, I can't see them very well. Okay. What 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 kind of, of mouse or trackpad do you have? I'm using my laptop, so I just have a little touchpad. Fine, two finger, two fingers. Yeah, do a two finger slide on the touchpad. I was trying that. Okay, yeah, it was fine. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Should should zoom. Yes. Okay. Yeah, all, all all the recent versions of Mac OS have that. Very Everyone clear? I trust this was entertaining. Yeah, it's lovely. Yeah, I, I, it's a very useful tool. It can save you a lot of time in the lab, letting you focus your energies on things that are likely to be productive. Now, in terms of the, uh, 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 of, you know, the binding affinities, I tend to be very, very skeptical of whether it's worth going any further with things with binding affinities below minus 5. But all the stuff from minus five to you know minus twelve, minus thirteen, seems to be you know very likely to have something real associated with it. It's not a bad tool. Anyone have any problems? Has every has everyone completed their download and and gotten their run to run? Is somebody still stuck? We have complete success. I have success on my end. Mine's awesome. I'm good. Oh, excellent. All right. So, the, the, despite our problems with, with, with stability on, on PyMol, we at least have something which seems to run in a stable and reliable way on each of your machines. I would suggest trying to get this installed on more machines on your campuses and see if there's any problems so we know early if there are and we can address them. I suspect they won't be. This one's this one seems pretty straightforward. Excellent. Okay. So I am going to try and figure out how to stop sharing my screen unless somebody has a question that they're gonna want me to do something on. Okay, so back to my screen share. Okay, let me stop. All right, so now we are back, I think, to just voice. Everyone should be, now be happy, happily not having to look at my, my, my screen. All right, so I don't have anything else on, on you know, that I wanted to show you today. I, I really don't think we should try and take chances of, of trying to get you into a full Autodoc installation because I think this is enough for the next year. Anyone have any problems with that? Have, have, have a particular institutional need where you need to do a full Autodoc installation? 
So do you guys, I might have missed this, do you guys have a library of, of the kinds of substrates you think we're going to be testing with your small set of hydrolases? Well, the, 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 the source of, you know, the library of ligands in uh, um, PDB format is ligand expo. The more general library is, is, is PubChem. But what we're doing right now is one of the students is going through and checking the prices of substrates. And we're building up a list of the ones that look like they would be cost effective. You know, the, 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 the $50 a gram type things. Yeah. Okay, instead of the $300 per gram. And that list should be done soon. And then those, those would be the ones on which we would, you know, extract from Ligand Expo, Expo and Kempub as, as the, yeah, the, 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 the good targets to use. Okay, it's, it's, other, mainly, it's mainly a price of, of you know, what do chemicals cost? One, one other thing I wanted to mention on this was, um, and another thing that we can do and will do is, let's say we do a structural alignment with one of our hydrolases with something in the PDB that has a ligand. We'll take that ligand and try to bind it to our structure. You know, yeah. to structure of unknown function, see how it works. Uh, and, uh, you know, the goal here is is to try to find out what's touching what, you know, and, and what will bind the best. And, and so uh, there's a lot of options out there. But, you know, initially we're trying to find chromogenic molecules that, you know, so that we can, we can look for activity. Okay, so I have one quick question. Well, maybe it's not a quick question. It might be an ugly question. <laughs> um, at the ASBNB meeting, when Paul's student gave her beautiful talk on her successful um, documentation of having found a protein, Karen Allen got up and said, Paul, do you remember this? She got up and said, but that's a really bad substrate, the one that you use. Don't you realize that that's not a good... All right, now Karen Allen has gobs of money. So I'm wondering, that has stuck in my head. How long has it been since March 31st? Right. That has been stuck in my head as with a really bad feeling. And uh, I'm just wondering how you felt about that. Well, I, I, I agree with Karen, you know, and, and if, if... So was it a fine economic concern that she, was, she wasn't addressing because she's got so much money? Well, the Karen Allen, I'm not sure if it was Karen, but other, there were other people in that meeting who, talk, who talked about basically having a collaborator that would produce a substrate library for them. So yeah. instead, of, instead of going to Autodoc and trying to guess if stuff would fit, they would call up their organic chemist down the hall and say, could you make me 10,000 different molecules? Can I have them by Tuesday? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we, we don't have that option. Uh, and we all, you know, and, and for us to follow the reactions, you know, you know we're, this is a very crude match initially. But for us to follow the reactions, we need a chromogenic substrate. Eventually, um, we'll move on to doing things like mass spectrometry or NMR to look at, you know, to see if catalysis is happening. For you know, for molecules that are invisible. There are limitations in terms of you know both financial and safety limits on the substrates that can be used oh, yeah. in the undergraduate teaching curriculum. Oh yeah. And, and so yeah, what you would do if you were dealing with a graduate student or a postdoc is different than what you're going to do when you're dealing with undergraduates. So, yeah. so, for example, we could have that that lousy substrate that at least would function and give us activity. And yeah. If we identified some other molecules that were not chromogenic but but would be part of a product or an inhibitor, then we could see how that would compete with that substrate. You know, was it a competitive inhibitor of the reaction? And we could follow that. You know, so so we these are the approaches we're we're thinking about on our end, in light of the fact that we don't have an unlimited budget and we don't have an unlimited number of organic chemists that are back in call. Mm -hmm. Now, there may be other solutions. So if you think of another, an alternative approach, that would be very welcome. Yeah, well, here's the thing. I know Frank Rochelle pretty well. And he's a collaborator on this, on, on Debbie Dunaway Mariano and Karen Ellen's 
project. So I was going to talk to him, but not if it seemed like, because he also has a ton of money. So I wasn't going to bother talking to him if it was all completely economical. Eco economic. Well, but it would be no. I don't think there's any harm in bringing somebody in who could enrich what's being done in a place where you have the resources to do it. Yeah. I mean, I should, I what's wrong with that? If this is complex enough as it is, <laughs> that's what's wrong with it. No, I'm but, just, uh, no, no, but, but the, what's likely to happen, very likely to happen, is you'll have a large number of students who try this and simply do it, and that's it. And you'll have one or two at some point who get onto something really, really important. And then it will become important to find the best substrates and the best approaches. And they may need to go out and see collaborators, yep. and then you know, and, and, and you know, find ways to really pursue that particular molecule. I'm not saying that that's something you want to do with every student in every class. But when you know, when you strike gold, mine it. You know, it's a perfectly good thing to do. Well, I'm going to, it sounds like this worked for everybody, which is delightful after our experiences with Promol and Pymol for the last couple of A major relief. I was very nervous about doing this. Well, it went great. So um, I'm going to save this and uh, put it where people who did not do this can download it and install it. And I think this is a good demo that, that we, can, we can certainly uh, keep in our collection and use in the future. Yeah. Right. And the email should tell them that it looks like the best download site is the Google Drive site. Rather than the source word site for yeah. the for the DMG and, and the EXE. Sounds good. Okay. All right, folks. Well, I'll uh, I'll be getting hopefully getting a doodle poll out to everybody uh, shortly uh, before before I leave, um, and I'll be back in touch in about uh, ten or fifteen days. Right. And if you have any problems in the meantime, send email to Jeff Mills or me, and we will try and help. Okay. Thank you, guys. Yep. Have a good trip, Paul. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's fun. It's it's a wedding. My niece is getting married, so that'll be fun. I know. I know. Weddings. My daughter's getting married, so mine's got more angst than yours. I, I get well, and and it's your daughter. I can't. My I have I've had two sons get married so far, and that was pretty emotional for me. But when that little girl walks down the aisle, I'm not sure if I'll be much good besides maybe standing upright. So. Barely stand it. <laughs> Sounds wonderful. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay. 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 Thanks, Herb. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, everybody else. Right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.